Well, everyone, I, I appreciate you all hopping on the call today to go over the webinar session of the um, Deconstructing Managed Service Profitability. Uh, in this, this is stuff that I've built over the last few years and really trying to mature a lot of the MSPs that I both operated, worked for, and consulted with. And really what became apparent to me very early on was that no one really takes the time to coach a lot of our service teams through the economics of how a managed service provider makes money. So real early on at my MSP, what I started to do was develop a way to communicate how profitability works inside an MSP and how the service teams can help support that profitability. Now, it, well, it included a lot of other stuff that's not inside of today's presentation, uh, but what it really allows you to do is to conceptualize how you can drive profitability in your organization and how, when we go from a macro perspective all the way down to a micro perspective, how we can build scorecards and KPIs to help your teams grow and mature your business. Um, and what I've also done to go one step further for everybody is I've actually allowed the ability to build this into an Excel calculator so that you can start to, as a service leader, understand that, hey, if my price is here and I have this many users, here's how I need to operate my teams in order to be successful. So I'm going to be a little quicker than if you're on the presentation at IT Nation. Um, because I do want to get to that tool so I can show everyone how to use it. And then everyone that's in the call today will get access to this. So you can have it, you can rebrand it, do whatever you want with it. There is a Q&A function inside a team. So please start to do there. I'll go ahead and try checking on it every few minutes just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Got a lot of screens open though. So trying to uh, also juggle my screen real estate here. Um, and then other than that, let's go ahead and get this kicked off. So today, the agenda, we're going to go a little definition setting on what managed services is as far as this conversation is going. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the methodologies. We're going to go into a little bit of the actual problem that we are trying to solve for today. We're going to go into a funnel logic that I have built out for everyone today. And then we're going to have some calls to action. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a turnaround expert over the last 20 years. For a of you that aren't familiar with that nomenclature, a turnaround guy is the one that comes in there because the business wants to either grow or they need to get themselves out of a hole. I did this for Best Buy for about five or six years where they would send me store to store to flip them around to being profitable uh, or profitability to budget. And then I also did this for a few MSPs. Uh, from there, I started a little consulting firm called Sierra Pacific Group. I co-founded that with some other people. And we were able to really cement how the PSA could help you develop and mature your practices. This also led into doing some fractional bookkeeping as well as some RMM management. So it really allowed myself to develop some of these ideas with seeing thousands of MSPs come in and having very similar challenges and a lot of it really came down to what you commonly hear as a book by Michael Gerber called The E-Myth. For those of you that aren't familiar with The E-Myth, the whole idea, he wrote this back in the 70s, was that it's a practitioner that wants to open a small business and they want to share their craft with the world. Now, what he was talking a lot about in this was, you know, legal services, financial services, wealth services, right? Anything that was in that realm, because IT wasn't really existing in the 70s, was the whole idea that a person that starts a firm, that's a professional, wants to share their craft, right? I already said that. But beyond that, their craft doesn't have a lot of traditional business economics. It doesn't have a lot of business strategies, playbooks, processes. So what a lot of us do is we struggle to get over that first growth hump because we don't know how to create those foundations. Now, I was in that boat, just like a lot of you. So I started to obsess about business strategy, not obsess about some of the technical functions. I made a decision about 15 years ago that my technical stuff was going to have to take a back seat because I really enjoyed turning around companies. So over that, I've developed a lot of practices that have allowed businesses to have substantial growth. And I've used some tools like EOS, Scaling Up, Pinnacle, and started to really massage them to fit the IT services industry. 
Um, so I've been in this community for the last 20 years in many of the facets. I help out MSP Geek quite a bit, especially with that MSP Geek conference that's going to be happening next year. Uh, and also really big in the IT community as far as IT Nation, Evolve, HTG, uh, Taylor Business Group, all those guys. Uh, right now, I'm really working on a new obsession, which is the MSP of 2030, because I do think that there are going to be some substantial economic differences, as well as operational efficiencies that need to be developed to support these businesses into 2030. Now, why I'm obsessing about it is for a lot of us MSPs to make the turnaround to supporting this different type of a business economics situation, or uh, I should say market demand, we need really substantial cash flow in order to make this happen. And not only to make it happen successfully, but also to have the money to actually uh, support some of these new pivot strategies. Uh, just got some fun photos as well. Uh, I was in a lot of the marketing ads for IT Nation, if you didn't see it. Uh, I'm also a triathlete, so I competed in an Ironman about two years ago, three years ago, and really the idea was discipline. I wanted to really work on my own turtle discipline because growing a business requires a lot of discipline in the sense of keeping pace to hit some of those BHAGs that you may have. Now, a quick little promotional thing, you know, why, why I'm really beginning heavily invested into the maturity of MSPs from a leadership and executive perspective is a lot of the times what I saw in my past was owners that were frustrated knowing that they could be better. They're great at customer service, they're great at operations, they're great at doing stuff with their clients. But they just, they, and they know that they have something different, something special, something that really can drive them forward. So what they essentially wanted to do is find a way to break through some of those glass ceilings or those growth challenges, those growing pains, as some of us may call it, and figure out how do we get there. And those ones that were 100% convinced, I wanted to find a way to really hold them accountable and drive them to those success. Uh, and a fun little quote that I always would throw out is, the people on top of the mountain don't really fall there, right? You got to climb that mountain. And not only that is sometimes as you're climbing the mountain, you got to look back and you got to go, oh, cool, look at all the progress we've made. And we forget to do that sometimes, which creates sometimes that feeling of burnout. Sometimes it feels like you, you're spinning your wheels. And while you're probably not spinning your wheels, sometimes you have to have that ability and that discipline to look back and appreciate some of those victories you've had. I was um, reading a book, uh, a rereading of a book that I really enjoyed called The Gap in the Gain by Dan Sullivan. And what he explains a lot is sometimes this idea of happiness as a business owner starts to diminish because our, our direction of where we're going, right, that goal. Sometimes we make that goal, but that goal is really relative to our peers. And you see it all the time in the Reddit community, in this MSP community of, oh, I need to be this big. I need to get into m and I need to do this. I need to do that. And the problem, though, is that that goalpost keeps moving. It keeps going up. And as it keeps going up, then we feel like we're not really accomplishing anything. And what Dan calls that is the gap. Uh, one of the examples that he uses is, right, you have a bunch of kids and you're going to give them cookies. Well, they're really excited to receive those cookies. And what you, right, and everyone gets one. And sometimes what you'll hear is, oh, you know, Zach got a bigger cookie than me. And immediately their happiness is completely gone because now rather than getting a cookie, which is a milestone for them, they got a smaller cookie than a friend. And that is what causes sometimes this gap analysis where we just can't find a way to keep up. Now, what he talks about is the gain, the, the progress that you have made to make your business healthy, to support a living, to hire people, to do what you love, your craft. And a lot of times we need to take that time to appreciate that. So a lot of times when I'm working with my clients, I really try to not focus on the market analysis or on some of the comparables to peers, because if it works for your business, it provides a life that you like, and you're able to share your craft in the way you want to share it, then that should be an accomplishment in itself. So what I want to do really is define managed services. And the reason I want to do this is a lot of us that are on this call today probably have our own definition. And if we have our own definition, we're going to have our own standards, and we're going to have our own way of thinking about the information that I'm going to present to you today. So what I want to do is go through a quick little practice of what we are going to define managed services as today 
That way it allows us to be able to use that information productively rather than saying, oh, I provide security services inside of it. I provide VCIO services with mine. I provide this extra endpoint and this extra mail filter, yada, yada, yada. I, I see commonly the way that we discuss and we talk about our services as MSPs is sometimes we include too much of the bundling and not just our core definition. So how we define it and how we're going to work on it today is I have two definitions that I've pulled from the internet that I really enjoyed. The first is from CompTIA, which is the central tenet of the managed services model is a provider customer relationship based on a contract backed by a service level agreement, meaning I am providing services, a relationship to the client, right? This is a fractional relationship in order to provide some level of service. And that service for us with SLA, right, is IT, help desk, uh, technical consulting. And another definition I really liked was managed services is the practice of outsourcing the responsibility for maintaining and anticipating need for a range of process and functions in order to improve operations and cut expenses. And I think that's really important. We get away from this at times, right? It's an alternative to the break, fix, or on-demand outsourcing model where the service provider performs on-demand services and bills the customer only for work done. So kind of going back in time, right? Hopping the DeLorean, gun it to 88 miles an hour. If we go back to when this all started, back in the day for IT, we made money when shit broke, which would annoy our target market because... Now we are incentivized for things to break. So sometimes you would see some of those, you know, break fix shops where they would only do the bare minimum so that they could bill more in the future. And the whole idea of going managed services was one, an easier way to bill. Two, it's a recurring model. Three, we become a true fractional IT department or technology department for that client because either they're too small to have their own or two, they'd rather save money and outsource it. So... For this, right, what it is and what it's not is its services, its availability, consulting, fractional IT, vendor management, help desk, response times, right? We're not going to be talking today about all these extra things that we can now offer as subsequent services for our clients, right? That hardware leasing, SaaS resale, backup, security, cloud services, moves, education, all those other little things, right? We're just going to forget about it for in the terms of this conversation. Now, to really make it simple, right? The old me methodology was shit broke, your clients asked for help, and we collected the money. And the whole idea that we're gonna be talking about today is that we set an agreement at a set price, we manage and automate, because we, at the end of the day, we need to control some of our input to be more proactive, and then that's how we make money. And I also categorize this in a lot of my clients with how they structure their business. And I break it down to a very easy level to understand that the functions of your company are finding work, doing work, and getting paid. So, right, that's your sales, ops, and finance departments traditionally. But if we think of it in those terms, now we're able to understand where we are accountable in order to drive profitability in our businesses. Now, what's fun about this is it makes profitability and driving profitability pretty easy. We charge more or we do less. We charge more or we do less. Now, this is probably a good time to talk about for those on the call that are more in the service manager role or the technician role on why profitability is so important for business. And I think if you want a really good understanding and a good reading of, on why this becomes such a driver, there's a book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. And he did this really long uh, analysis. He actually took it from a very researcher perspective, and he looked at businesses that were extremely successful over a 30-year time span. Now, in that 30-year time span, what he wanted to look for were businesses that had substantial growth and maintained that growth for about 15 years after they went ahead and became that market leader from their comparable businesses. And one of the things that was really obvious as they went through this research was there was this concept in the businesses that were more profitable or were more successful, right? When it came to benefits, happiness of the employees, the ability to maintain the growth, right? They just didn't grow one year and then it disappeared the next year. 
And one of the big differentiators of these businesses that had these tenured employees that loved working there, they were driving it, they had a leadership team firing on all cylinders, was this concept of profit per X. Now, they didn't do this cognizantly, the, the businesses themselves, but what he found was a lot of these businesses had a, the ability to measure, control, and pivot based off of a single KPI, which was some type of profit per variable. And then that's how they were able to maintain some of these agreements, relationships, and product lines that they were able to offer their customers. Now, this is interesting, especially for us as managed service providers, because we have the ability to really have great microeconomics, scorecards, KPIs. There's hundreds and thousands of them, right, that we can see through many different reports like Cognition 360. Now, obviously, this requires the data in your databases to be clean and people to put time into their tickets correctly. And you're going to hear me talk a lot about that today. Uh, TLDR or hint, hint. If your engineers aren't putting time into their tickets, then don't pass go. Do not collect $200. Time is not a way to macromanage or micromanage your employees. Time inside of tickets and nice ticket hygiene is a function of operating your business and making sure that your pricing is set correctly and your standards are carrying you into the future. I can't do that without accurate tickets and time entry. So, right, if there's one thing you take away from today is that has to stop. Time entries has to be done on time. They have to be done appropriate tickets. And your ConnectWise Manage or your auto task or your PSA needs to be set up in a way to where I can adequately enter that data and then see the financial reporting. Now, why I say this is this profit per X model is critical for us to understand what is the profitability per business unit or per SKU that I have to manage my managed services. So whether you do endpoints or user type pricing, right, I have to be able to manage the profitability of every single client because that's the only way then I can then put money back into the business in form of benefits, growth, sales, marketing, administrative hires, right? All those extra things come out of the profitability of our managed services. So for you technical people on this call or your people that are in more of an operations or service department that aren't executives and owners, right? If we do not manage our clients to make profitability and do it in a way to where we can objectively see the data inside of the PSA, then we are running the business off of feel and it's always going to feel busy. It's always going to feel chaotic. And I'm never going to be able to feel like it's a good time to hire an additional resource. And I urge you to not make profitability taboo in your companies because it really helps drive a business maturity at your service teams so that they can assist you now in growing the business. They can assist you in knowing that they are doing something right and not only are they doing something right, they are doing something to help the business that they work for grow, which means that they at some point will receive some type of value for that company maturing. This is where you see a lot of really mature businesses start to offer things like profit sharing, bonuses, variable pay models, because now we have a way of measuring and holding those things accountable. I can't tell you how many times myself as a technical person, I'd get really annoyed when that tier two guy that's sitting right next to me, that's making a little bit more money than me, is working less than I am. He goes home at five, I stay till six. And there's no objective way of knowing who is putting in effort to help the business, right? We want, as engineers, we want things to be objective. We want data to be reported, but I still see this sense of like, oh, time entry is micromanagement. So let's just have a real clean one. That's my quick tangent of the day. We're squashing that. Now, keeping this going, right? The problem with so much noise and inconsistencies, there's real norm on what is bundled on what KPRs are critical to create an expectation of managing costs. We talk a lot about cost management. We talk a lot about profitability being a result. And what we also though see is, and I see this time and time again, is service management is meant to manage services. So if you have technical manager, service manager, and you're managing the help desk and the field teams and the project services teams, your main goal in a traditional sense is to manage the economics of delivering that service. That is what operations is. It was sold for this price that had this budget, and that budget gives me this much time to deliver said services. 
And right, we talked charge more or do less to make more profitability. I don't know to charge more, hint, hint, if time entries aren't done. So the problem is that we have also those service managers that are commonly uh, promoted to a management role because they were the best sysadmin or tier three engineer, yet we don't do any time to develop their skills as a people manager, as a cost manager, as someone managing the bottom line. And that's really what I want to address today is some quick tips on how we can better manage this bottom line so that we can have a better analysis of should we charge more rather than just these off the cuff abilities to say, oh, we're going to increase our pricing 15%. Why? Because you also don't want to make yourself so expensive that now you're not competitive in your market and you have the potential for someone to now take your clients because they can give you it at that same service at a lower price. Now, price isn't everything. There is quality, right? So let's not get into that. Uh, but right, let's figure out from a high level macro, let's look at the PL, what's important. And then how do we break that down all the way to our service teams? So commonly, what you'll see me talk about is profitability is a budget. It is, it is something that is expected, it, it, right? We need to get out of this thinking process that profitability is a variable result. It's just something that possibly happens. We, we, we can't grow our businesses that way because chances are at the same time that that's expected to make money, you're spending that profitability before you made it. And a lot of us in our forecasts and budgets are, are allocating that, prof, that, that sales marketing expense lines but we're also not managing it adequately. I, I did another conversation at IT Nation called Your Finances Suck. And essentially, one of the big things that I went into was that you should manage your sales and marketing budget based off of the quota and budget to top line revenue. Meaning, top line revenue is only 93% to budget. Sales and marketing needs to only be 93% to budget. Right? There needs to be that relationship, not just sales and marketing, spend whatever you want up to 100%, even if we're not meeting that top line goal. Now, that top line goal, though, isn't also responsible of sales because we have things like churn and growth metrics. So what we need to do is create that habit of being react, right? Take that, this, that habit of being reactive with profitability and find a way to make it an expectation. So a way, an easy example that I'm going to use is right? Obsessing about this cost and making an example of, hey, we have a client that's paying us two grand a month. Now, our margin expectation, right? This is just managed services. This isn't 365 and backup and all that other stuff. We've gone over that is 65%. And I just picked a random number. Yeah, that might be a little high for some of you, but I just picked it, which means that I have a profitability requirement of $1,300 a month because that's going to go into our sales and marketing budget. Now, what this does for best in class service leaders is gives you $700 now to manage that client. So when you think of it in this terms, right, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, wow, 700 bucks a month to manage a $2,000 a month client. How do I do that? There's a great book called Who Not How is also written by Dan Sullivan, where it kind of goes into this, right? As us as owners, you know, talking to the owners for a second, or as, as executives, we, we, we get so obsessed with the how, how things are going to be done, which then causes us to micromanage the how and completely leapfrog some of those leaders, the who that you have delegated to, to do the job that you've appointed for them. And this can cause sometimes employee churn issues because if you gave someone a service manager, a service director, finance director title and say, you own this, you got to let them own it. Successes and failures. So sometimes when we have these things, right, Mr. Service Director, I want you to find a way to manage to 65%. They will then figure out the how of how do I deliver $700 a month best in class services. Right. So for us service leaders, right, our brains start going to better standards, better onboardings, automation, all that good stuff. And you're all correct. But right, how our brains really will start to look at this is we now have the $700 budget. And I have some things that I need to fit into there because they're required for best in class services. Now, on the left side of this chart, right, we have some of those fixed variables, right? My service manager, 
endpoint cost, right? Because I need an RMM. AV costs, right? There's going to be, that's going to be somewhat bundled in there, right? VCIO, maybe it's a fixed one meeting a month, two hours a month, right? We can kind of fix that cost in order to scale how they pay for those services. But it's the other services where you commonly hear the, the phrasing, it's a race to the bottom. And what that phrasing really is trying to get home to a lot of us is it's a race to the bottom of making no money. Now, what is causing us to race to the bottom is that tier one, tier two, and tier three mix, because if the client's too noisy, or I have an expensive resource working easy tickets, I am actually delineating how much money I can then go ahead and spend. And you'll see it when we go into the calculator, and this probably isn't a stretch of anyone's imagination, my cost per hour for a tier three guy is a lot higher than my cost per hour for a tier one guy. So if I only have $700 a month to spend on the client, I can work a lot more hours, a lot more tickets with that tier one pie than that tier three pie. Now, these changes don't happen overnight, right? There's standards, there's knowledge books, there's playbooks, there's all those things to make things more efficient in your business. However, right, we need to the ability to start measuring this mix. That way, we can start to improve them over time to get to that point of to being able to deliver services for a client at $700 a month cost. Now, what's probably in your head is that there's some level now of, well, how do we start to measuring them, right? This goes back into that time entry, that ticket hygiene stuff. If your ticket entry sucks and your time entry sucks, then I have no way of being able to do this pie graph, which means my tier three is going to be working easy tickets because I don't know what he's working on or I don't have a dispatch model. Uh, or it could be, right, I don't know that I need to invest in automation or better scripts or our better standards and better onboardings because I don't have the data to objectively make those decisions. So when I start working with a lot of my clients, we kind of go over what KPIs are you measuring? And I get a whole slew of them. I know I broke them up into two categories here, but I could get anything from the below right? Kill rates, SLAs, first-time resolutions, agreement profitability, effective hourly rate, tier one kill rate, uh, uh, active hour or endpoint per month hours, some type of uh, ability to measure that, trying to get close to this profit per X idea. And they're all important. That's the cool thing. No one is wrong in this discussion. But when I look at the scorecards, if there is a scorecard, all of these items are on the service manager's scoreboard. Now, in really mature businesses, right, you only want four to five KPIs per employee. We want them to obsess about 80% of their week to be focused on driving five numbers. So when we see all of these KPIs on a single dashboard, that paralysis or not, paralysis by analysis starts to set in. And then what also starts to happen, right, is they're spinning plates and they're trying to get all these KPIs managed. They may focus on one plate for too long, right? Kill rate, for example, or first time resolution. And now we have a service manager, service director, service leader, who's even more billable cost per hour than a tier three guy trying to close tickets, trying to make sure systems are up. And that's not going to drive profitability or allow others to be accountable to the delivering of the service, delivering the service that your business requires. So we need to organize it. And luckily, most of us have an answer, right? We talked about the KPIs that are required. So if we borrow some of the practices from a similar vertical to us, which is fractional accounting, fractional finance, we need to figure out how these KPIs trickle down to other seats in our organizations. So what I've constructed for today and inside the tool as well is a funnel. Now, one thing I want to say about the funnel is I've used some very archaic titles. I'm not a huge fan of the tier system. I don't like the names. I think there's some pompousness in there. And I recognize a lot of you may not have a service director. So for all intents and purposes, right, this is building to scale. This is showing what a lot of best-in-class MSPs that get to that $20 million, $50 million, $100 million mark, what they will need in the organization from an ownership perspective, 
with the titles completely being stripped out. Right? Have fun with it. So starting off with someone in that tier one type category, right? We want to talk about percent escalated. We want to talk about the first touch, right? Are they able to answer that ticket quickly? Did it all their tickets pass some type of quality check? Backlog, right? How many of the tickets are in their name that are just in some type of purgatory existing with a bunch of red arrows? Billability, which we're going to talk about here in a second. And how many tickets did they close so we can look at some type of a volume situation? Now, kind of going in a little bit of the detail, because this will help a lot of the extra the parts of this conversation. Percent escalated. This becomes really important because, right, this is that first KPI for us to be able to understand that someone in tier one was unable to work a ticket and had to escalate it to somebody in a tier two type seat. Now, obviously, in the conversation of profitability, this is important because every time a ticket is escalated, I have conceivably constrained my budget to one less ticket to hit my profitability targets. So I need to be able to look over a time string, time line, excuse me, on what that looks like. And that becomes really important in contrast with some KPIs in tier two. SLA first touch, right? We just want to see how many tickets are we also able to close in that first touch. QC pass percentage is really a cool KPI because we should at some layer, not worried about who or, or not worried about how right now, but being able to quality check these tickets. Are we putting adequate time in? Did we put the time in right after we were done with the ticket? Did we put appropriate language inside the resolution notes that got emailed to the client and not just ticket done? Or... Here you go, sir, client. I did it, right? Some type of, like, we all want those pleasantries. We've all been in that situation where you look at a ticket and you're like, I can't believe you just told that to the client. And this is a way to where we can really start to also understand how many tickets didn't pass on a per employee basis. So when we go into these conversations with the employee and we start to talk about performance, we can say, hey, only 30% of your tickets pass QC. What can we do to help you have more of them pass QC? And what is going to happen if more of them do not pass QC? Backlog red arrows, that's a more of a connect wise thing, but backlog is pretty self-explanatory, right? Are you doing your paperwork? Did anything get lost? And if something did get lost, let's have a KPI to recognize that so that we can spot it real quick. Because I know you don't have any open tickets that are like 150 days old right now. Right? We, we, we all have quite a few of them. Billability. So this is the most important one, right? To me, anyway, as someone that tries to drive growth of businesses. So billability, uh, sometimes you'll hear in the finance world, realized utilization. Or sometimes you will hear utilization. Regardless of the word you use, the idea here is if I work 40 hours in a week, how many of those hours were billable to a client? Doesn't matter if the client got an invoice, right? It might be included in their agreement, but how many of those hours were actually going to the client? And this KPI is so critical to scaling your business because it allows us to not only set thresholds to, hey, at a certain billability, we're probably burning out employees and we need to recruit but also being able to predict on the PL, more of a macroeconomics, where our gross profit is going to end. And we're gonna show, show you how that works a little bit also in the scorecard that I built for everybody. And tickets closed, that's just a fun one. It, 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 that one, I'm not as concerned about these days. Sometimes kill rate's a better way of dredging the volume, but some ability to predict how many tickets per engineer are we growing or are we closing because then that will also show you over time how effective your tier one has been able to grow. Now, tier two is very similar. The only ones that really change are things like kill ratio, turn time, right? We can't have tier two guys spending two hours on a ticket because that costs quite a bit of money, depletes from the budget. Billability is still on there. That's going to be a very common KPI. And the one thing that's different that you probably haven't seen before is knowledge-based articles created. 
What I like to see, and what a lot of I see in best-in-class MSPs, is some ability to expect that knowledge base articles, standardization articles, playbooks, whatever you call them, are created to match the ratio of tickets escalated. Meaning, if I escalated five tickets this month from tier one to tier two, I would hope at some point be able to see that five knowledge base articles were then written so that next time that tier one guy doesn't have to escalate the tickets. It's a way to identify, are we knocking these out? Now, there are those situations where you can't just write a knowledge base article, right? It's a standard. It's something that sales needs to start bundling. It's, it's bad hardware, right? There are those times where I'm just, you know, I can't always be a one-to-one, but I want some ability to look at that relationship which then, right, should result in less tickets being escalated over time. Where tier three really turns into more of that standards, that automation, the sometimes even the sales engineer types it roles. I used to tell a lot of my tier twos that they can't really be a tier three until they learn how to voc- verbalize, how they learn how to be talking to our clients in very tough situations. Hey, Mr. Client, your server's on fire. Yeah, I can get you back up in 30 to 40 minutes, but we, now we really do need to replace it. I've gone ahead and already sent the specs over to our sales team to get you a quote. So if you could, can you get that signed by the end of the day? I'll probably be done by the end of the day. That way I can show up in a week, install that new server, and get rid of this one that I've holding together right now with hot glue and popsicle sticks. So what you'll see is percent closed by automation, right? Are they developing the RMM platform to close more tickets without our involvement, right? They're really, they're trying to have the company work smarter, not harder. How many scripts did they write? Standards created, right? And we're talking about this onboarding stuff. Are they saying, hey, every client we get, let's change Active Directory to look like this. Let's change their, their, their Azure group policies to work in some different way so that we don't have to work on this, or we can have knowledge-based articles to help them. This really works as well for those of you that are vertically aligned, because you also are going to have to be developing knowledge-based articles to work on some of these line of business applications that are specific to your vertical. Turn time. Right, that never goes away, especially at tier three. They're going to have a real high, high cost per hour. System uptime, right? This could be for both your clients and your internal systems. If they're going to have some type of management for the internal systems at certain sizes, though, you will have your own internal IT. I like to keep that in the, the kind of that finance world. And then platform KPIs, right? If you have portals to some of those third party things that have their own costs, right? Those backups, the 365s, they'll usually have some management of that. Now, how does this trickle down to the service managers? This is right, your agreement grows profitability. What is your profitability per client? Which also, right, needs to be managed in con- contrast with effective rate, right? Your grow- agreement gross margin may be 65%, but if it's only $100 effective rate, then that margin dollar or that profit dollar isn't really what I am expecting to run this business on, right? I could make 65% of $2 all day, but right, I'd rather make higher dollars. So it kind of match it with market incentives, really. QC percent, right? So they need to look at, they're the ones doing those quality checks of the tier one guys, right? Is that work being done or did they escalate a ticket that didn't need to be escalated, right? That, now we're really breaking into that management ability. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention with tier three, and I don't know if this was on here, is um, knowledge base articles approved. Right. If the tier two guy is writing the knowledge base article to manage that percent escalated, let the tier three guy then be the quality per- person to make sure that that documentation was written. Sorry, I skipped over that one, but that's a real important one to take it off of that service manager's plate. Uh, first time resolution, right? We want to make sure that we're always maintaining that high percentage. Customer satisfaction starts to get bundled up into this level, right? It's at every level, but this really becomes that team etiquette. And then SLA for ticket resolved. Are we meeting those SLAs if we are an SLA type of business that, hey, we are resolving these in the time that we expected. Now, whether service manager and service director or however you phrase these positions, right, this is these KPIs need to be accountable. doesn't matter about the position. They might be service manager and service director, as I show you, might be the same person or service director may even be you, the executive. But what you have to be accountable for is gross profit to budget, right? Profitability is an expectation, so it needs to be budgeted and accountable. 
wrote, and this is on a PL perspective, by the way, this is not in your PSA. Gross margin, right? Are we maintaining that percentage? Because we're going to have blended margins now on a PL. Excuse me. And with having those blended margins, right, I need to be able to make sure that it's going to support my sales and marketing team. Realized utilization. So from a PL perspective, am I utilizing my service costs? I like to put all of my service team in COGS to support the revenue that they are bringing in. Now, I know that's sometimes controversial, but for me in every business that I was operating, the businesses that I've grown to maturity, I have to have my employees in COGS so that I can run the business to make sure that my profitability becomes an expectation because I am not hiring another service member until I am overly profitable because I have more revenue than people to deliver the service, right? That's the idea of measuring billability. And then churn percentage, right? I mentioned earlier, top line revenue is not just a sales, per, sales goal because sales may be bringing in two clients every single month going above and beyond their quota. But if service sucks and can't keep up with the demand, you're gonna have two clients walk out the door. So now you have a two in, two out, two in, two out, and I can't hold sales accountable at that point. So I gotta make sure that churn, and you can do this in dollars or units, doesn't matter. I need to be able to hold them accountable to my clients once they come in, need to stay in. And as many of us know, the clients that are older are usually more profitable because I've had more time to understand them, learn them, standardize them, get them new stuff. So I don't want those clients walking out the door. And right, there's some other components to this, like onboarding investment and all that good stuff. But for now, right, this is really to manage your profitability. So some of the ways that I commonly see that are beyond just the KPIs to grow the profitability is some other little non-linear type measurements, things like automation of tickets, right? We saw that with tier three. Knowledge-based articles created, maintained, and approved, right? From your, your teams, not just the service manager. First touch resolution is massive, right? That tier one engineer, he can knock out a lot more tickets at his rate in order for us to be able to support some of the lifestyles we want to bring into the business or the growth opportunities we want to invest into. And then billability and standards. Billability, bar none, requires time entry, requires clean tickets, requires a great PSA structure. And if your PSA is not super clean, I can give plenty of recommendations on people that can completely whip those into shape. But beyond that, right, I have to know it to be able to manage my business, not just from a macro perspective, but a micro perspective. I need to know, is there one client that is calling in every single day because the coffee machine's not working, which is taking away that time for that tier one guy to be working other tickets. Or are they so under profitable because they were that client from six years ago. He's a real good buddy. And, 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 you know, I go to his kid's birthday parties and he was my first client and he got the homey hookup pricing because I just needed revenue. Well, if they're that good of a buddy and you're making 3% margin on them, you should be able to have that conversation with them to say, hey, my business has grown. It's matured. We've added a lot of value to what we're trying to accomplish. And your rates will have to go up. And for those ones that aren't your buddies, that you're not going to see uh, their kids' birthday parties, right? They're going to get this, you know, here's a 40% increase. And beyond that, right, let's think about this. Inflation cost of living and the year of great re uh, resignation happened this year and all of our costs went through the roof. So if you're not raising your prices, your billability is going way higher than it needs to be. And it's making everyone burned out because I don't have money to hire now the next guy because I didn't increase my prices in order to create more budget to match inflation, to match uh, cost of living increases. That's really at the end of the day, increases are supposed to match your cost increases. I know I said that weird, but you guys get what I'm saying. So putting this into practice, really what helps a lot of organizations is a functional accountability chart with KPIs. What do I mean by this? Org charts, great, you have a title, but someone still needs to own the KPI. 
So every seat in your company needs to have four to five KPIs that they own. And when I mean own it, they own it. Your job makes or breaks based off of this. And if you haven't noticed by now, one of those KPIs does require really good time entries. I don't think I have time to go over it today, but right, there's some level of analysis of your people to understand if you don't like it, then unfortunately I can't operate my business under this. My business requires this to mature and grow, which means that I need structured employee onboardings and training so that they understand my expectation. I have a real simple way of knowing are employees doing what's expected of them or are they being defiant? And the first is I have to teach them what is expected of them. If I don't tell them it's expected, then how can I hold them accountable to that? And the second, do they know how to do what is expected of them? Because right all day I can tell you, hey, you're required to be this percent billable. But if I don't teach them how it's calculated, how that gets contributed with time entry, and why that time entry is important to the business, then I may not adopt that. I need to review consistently with my employees those five KPIs on some type of quarterly review system. And it could just be a conversation, doesn't have to be a formal sit down and score you, but I need to see that. And then last but not least, what I call a top five, bottom five meeting. It could be top two, bottom two, top three, bottom three. The idea here is simple. Every month, your account managers, VCIOs, service manager, whoever, need to look at the top profitable clients and the bottom profitable clients and discuss them. Put an action plan for both. Because the ones at the bottom are simple, right? Either they need to buy that new server or they need to stop calling as much or need a price increase. So they're easy. They cut and dry, get it done. But the ones at the top, I'm worried about. Those are the ones that are quiet. They've been your client for six, seven years. They're like 90% profitable. I've seen these in your guys' ConnectWise databases. Those are the ones I can't afford to lock, you know, let walk out the door. So if you need to take them out to a steak dinner and spend a $1,000 bar tab, go do it because I need to keep them in-house. So turning this into action, right? Invest into the year of maturity. Really think next year with all the stuff that we talked about today, how can I put that into a plan to climb that mountain so that I can live in the gain and not in the gap? And business is a marathon, right? Take that time to look behind you and go, cool, look at how things have improved. Keep a scorecard where I can see that improvement over the last, you know, 12 weeks, 16 weeks. So I can actually reward my employees as well. Create action to investigate where you are, right? If your database isn't clean right now and, you, and you're and you trying to live in the game, but you can't because the only thing you have is comparables, then you need to invest in making that data in your PSA and in your, in your ledging, ledger software to be accurate. And then you need to tr communicate, train, and delegate with your team. And if you're struggling with that, give me a call. This is what I specialize in, is really breaking down these business milestones, these BHAGs, to be bite-sized chunks, right? That old adage, how do you eat an elephant? So that we can go ahead and knock this out together. It's why I use the image of the mountain. We need to be able to go to each new milestone, each plateau, and then look back on what we've done. So if we do need to pivot at one point, right? There's rumors that we have an economic downturn next year, that, that we can pivot accordingly. And here's how to get a hold of me. So I, I want to keep this up a little longer. You guys know how to get a hold of me. You saw it on some form I emailed you or whatever. So I want to switch over to the calculator and also see if we have any questions yet. Um, so if I go into the Q&A, let's see. What assumptions are you making regarding the percentage of total revenue is accounted for by MRR? Or does this work regardless of the percentage? Yeah, this works regardless of the percentage. I know it's, we've gone quite a while from this question. But at the end of the day, really... If we have an expectation, because if we look at our forecasting and budgeting that we've all modeled, right, and we're all ready to put on, uh, to freeze into place in our ledging system for next year, that means that if I am expected 12% net profit next year, that means I'm spending a certain amount of money on sales, marketing and expenses, which means that my business has to have a certain profitability to grow. Now, if I have a stretch goal and I want to grow that a little bit more, then I just need to say my service margin needs to be 60%, but it's forecasted at 58%. So kind of, you can kind of think of it that way. And it might make more sense when I show you the calculator. So let me dive into this. All right. Can you guys see the uh, Excel? 
cool. I see some. Yeah. I appreciate the feedback. So what I've built for you guys is a cool little uh, spreadsheet where we are able to really quickly figure out what our budget is by looking at the company and then looking at also how that affects the micro and macroeconomics of our business. So in the spreadsheet and when you're filling it out yourself, right, what you'll really want to focus on in the very beginning is this labor tab. Now, this labor tab has the ability to put your burden rate. So for those of that you don't know, burden is all the overhead costs that you have of an employee, the insurance, the taxes, the unemployment, uh, the benefits, whatever you offer them. And it's a way for you to figure out what your true cost of an employee is. It also allows you to put the days of PTO and the days of holiday so that you can figure out the number of billable hours your employees have per year. Then on any of these call, these uh, cells that are white, by the way, are the ones that you can play with. If they're if they're solid, that's probably because they're some, locked into some equation. So you're able to go through here and enter your salary. So I just put some ones at random in here that it's not really important. All the way from service director down to dispatcher. This is then going to calculate what their burden is per year based off of that percentage and give you a total cost of that employee per year. Now, last but not least, these billability targets, right? We talked about how this is a great KPI for your employees to understand where is their capacities. But this also allows for us to figure out how much does that employee cost me per hour when they're working on a client. So this is a great, easy way for you as service leaders to go, hey, if I have a service director work a ticket, he costs me $742 an hour because he's mostly working on the business, not on clients. So that has to be a really good ticket for that to be worked in contrast with a tier one guy who's about $41 an hour because for the most part, he is sitting at his desk every day working tickets. Now, as you can see, right, these billability targets, they go down as you're higher on the, on the ladder as far as tier one, two, three. And the idea behind this is you will be less billable in some instances because you're writing knowledge base articles. You're creating standards, you're writing scripts. It's not directly in service to that client. And I need to be able to budget in time for these employees to be able to work that. So once we have all this calculated out, we're actually able to go into a microeconomic deep dive. And this is more of like what you would see in your PSA, where I can look at the actual client themselves. So what do I have here, for example, is a client that's 20 users at $175 a user. And I'm using a calculation of about 1.25 devices per user. I don't want to get into endpointer users. That, that's too long of a conversation for today. But what that real simple math allows me to see is that that client's going to be about $3,500 a month. Now, I put 365 and backup in here so you guys can look at what blended margins look like. But I'm going to ignore that for most of this call. Because what is important is this managed service margin. So to your question, David, right, I can put this whatever I want. And what it is able to do is show me with some little bit of error with RMM and AV endpoints stripped out that I now have $1,200 a month to service this client. Right, just like our $700 a month in the slide. Now, going one step further, and you guys are going to love this, just like in my slide deck, how do I then take that $1,200 a month with some of my fixed costs, right? One hour of service manager, because I don't have a service director. What is that cost per month? And then some other variables like VCIO and dispatcher, which then leaves me a budget of $551, right? It's the fixed cost total. Thank you, Nick. Which allows me to now spend $655 on service. Now, what you're able to do is kind of play with these. So if you want to look at your business, look at your PSAs, you can kind of make this more accurate and say, if my tier one is knocking out 60% of tickets and my tier two is 25 and my 15, then I have actually 13 hours per month to service this client. And what's cool is you guys can actually use this to model out okay, well, what if I get it to 70% and I knock down tier two to 15%, I just went from 10 hours to almost 13 and a half hours. So as you can see, this allows you guys to now figure out by using this, 
how much more time I'm able to get out of my clients. If I'm able to drive higher tier one resolution, and then subsequently, I am unable to spend more than $1,200. So it gives you that ability just to kind of model out what it would look like for your business. Now, the one last thing I wanted to throw in this calculator, and then I'll go ahead and, and we'll, we can all jump off the call, is I give the ability to look at this from a macro, a PL perspective, because just because my client is profitable, I may have two employees that sat on their hands all day. So what I'm able to do is actually enter the number of employees I have total in the organization, kind of a, a estimate of how many users I have in my company and what my average price per user is. And it's actually ABLES allows me from a macro perspective to see where my gross margin is going to end up from a managed service perspective. So right with one service manager, one VCIO, one tier three, one tier two, two tier ones and one dispatcher at 500 users at 175 bucks a user, I'm only able to get 37% margin with my capacities. Right, but let's see if I operated with one tier one right now I'm at 43%. So now that's part of doing less right now if I increase my cost per user by $10 a user per month right? That only got me to 46. So it allows you guys now to model out, right? What is my price and what does my growth need to look like to hit some of these gross margin goals that I may have? Now, beyond that, right? This is where blended margin gets important, right? Let's say I do have subsequent services and my ledger isn't as easy to understand because it's all blended, right? Service leadership, it's all categorized in one single column. So I have blended margins. This shows you that with an average 365 margin of 16% and backup margin of 35%, I actually did take a small little hit on my gross margin, or I did that wrong. Eh, you guys get the point anyway. Now, I went through that really fast, but I'm going to give it to all of you guys so you're able to kind of sit there and mess with it and use it and ask questions as you mess with it. But really, this allows you guys to kind of support figuring this out on your own. Uh, now, I, I know we hit the time limit, so I want to respect everybody's time. But if anyone wants to stay a little late and ask some questions, feel free to ask. Feel free to email me, call me, uh, whatever you need. I'll go ahead and support you guys through the holidays to make sure that this can help you guys grow into next year. And other than that, I appreciate your time. So if anyone has questions, uh, you're allowed to use the mics or submit them inside of uh, Teams. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, I agree with Dean. Good job. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it, Scott. Have a great Thanksgiving, brother. Hey, you too, man. Uh, are you going to send a hey, Kyle? Are you going to send out the recording and the spreadsheet and that stuff to everyone that was on here? Are you going to add it as attachment or? Yep. What are you doing? Yep. I'll, I'll send a link so everyone can download them. It's not going to be hidden behind some contact form. I know most of you on this call, so I don't need to yeah. rope you guys into your contact info. All right. Cool. Yeah. We appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it. No problem, Matt. Thank you. Hey, Kyle. Great job. Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate it, Mendy. You're always, I love your support. See you later. All right. It's looking like everyone's hopping off. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.